Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Um, we're gonna, that's going to be the core scripture for us today. So, yeah, let's, let's pray. Let's pray uh, before we jump into the Word. Father God, I, as we were worshipping, I was just reminded of um, John's vision and revelation of the scroll and the question of who is worthy on, on, on looking upon the scroll. And none were worthy except for you, Lord. So, Lord, we give you your word today. We ask that you would unpack it, Holy Spirit, that we invite you into the space. Will you teach us? Will you lead us into your presence? In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked um, by the leaders of the uh, Baptist summer camp. Has anyone been to summer camp here? Just to show of hands. Okay, cool. Some of you. Um, I was asked if I would be willing to run a workshop. And um, I'd grown up going to summer camp through some of my high school years. And some of my favorite memories from summer camp weren't actually the sermons. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, we'll leave it there. They weren't the sermons. It wasn't even the worship. It wasn't even like the sports or the community. If you can think back to your days as a youth, it was actually, there was this one pastor for two years in a row. He, um, during sports time, he asked me if I was a soccer fan. He, he ran a Q&A. And there was like a handful of us that rocked up to this Q&A. And we just sat for about three or four hours a day. And he just started unpacking the questions that we had. And I had grown up and I was just, if you look at me, I'm a serial doubter. I was an atheist before I was a Christian. Uh, and it was actually part of that journey that I became a pastor. You know, anyway, so back story. Uh, so when they asked me if I was willing to run a workshop, the first thing I asked was, was can I run a Q&A workshop? And they said, yeah, go ahead. And so day one, we put this box out in the front of the stage. And we said, these are the workshops. If you're coming to Q&A, fill out some questions, put them in the box. So I was thinking, like, back then, it was like 10 of us. And I open up this box, and there's about 60 to 70 questions. I was like, whoa, OK. <laughs> that's that's quite, quite a lot of questions. And so I realized I needed to categorize these things. And so I got this uh, trestle table out. And I started categorizing all of the questions so I can kind of see what the groupings were, what questions were asked more regularly than the others. And I had about 10 different groups, but there was one pile of questions that was way bigger. It was about that big and the rest were tiny. It was about, out of the 60 to 70 questions, 40 of them had to do with this category. Now I'd be interested to hear, you guys are very interactive, so I'd be interested to hear if you guys could guess what that pile of questions was all about. Dating? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. No. No. Nice try, though. I mean, they would like that. Yeah. They went to the dating workshop. That was, a big, that was a big one. Yeah, always good. Always good. Yeah. Gender? Yeah, that's a good one. No. It wasn't. Hey? Suffering. Yes. Suffering. I mean, I was going into this. I was like, I feel this is a lot of questions. I was thinking, I'm talking about to Gen Z's here. You know, the question is going to be like, Gender, identity, sexuality, confusion. How do I deal with this? And like, what does the Bible say? I was thinking, you know, you would, they would ask questions like, you know, why, is the Bi why does the Bible hate women? Or why is the Bible condone slavery? I mean, there's all of these really good questions that Gen Z's have. But there was two questions on gender and sexuality. And there was about 40 questions dealing with suffering. The, the nice theological term that we use is theodicy when we're wrestling between the reality of God, who we believe is good, who we believe is powerful, who we believe is loving, and then that reality that we live in, which is brokenness, the condition that, that sin has caused in this world. And, and so I saw this pile of questions, and I thought to myself, this, looking back, this was how I thought about it. I was like, what we need to do is we really need to help these students wrap their minds around the theology uh, of theodicy, help them wrap their minds around who God is and why there's brokenness in the world. And, and so we dedicated a whole day, like a whole session, just to the question of the Odyssey. And I got a lot of trouble for that. Like the leadership were like, when they, we all had our team meeting, they were like, why did you spend the whole time just speaking about suffering? It was because all the questions were about that. But as I, as I reflect back on that experience, I realized that I, I missed the mark a little bit. You see, Although it was really important to help them wrap their minds around the problem of pain and suffering and evil in the world, there's, there's only so much knowledge we can have and understanding. We can have a theological framework and a mental mind map of why. Why there's pain, why God is, and how that kind of fits together. And, and though that's important to help them kind of figure that out, what, we, what I didn't help them with was 
So I helped them create a theology of their mind. That was the, the goal. But I didn't help them form a theology of the heart. Because at the end of the day, like if I look around this room, what I love about BDC is just the diversity. I love it. It, it actually adds to the, the education. You know, like you get irritated with that person on the left, you get irritated with the person on the right, it's because they're shaping you, right? If you look around this room, we're all different. In different ages, different ethnicities, different races, different economic backgrounds, different denominations likely. We're all different. There's a few things that would unite us together. The one is Jesus, right? That's the reason why you're here. It's like you feel called to ministry, hopefully. Like, otherwise, I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> you know? um, but the other thing that we all share in common, not only together in this room, but with the rest of humanity, is the question of pain. Like I said to you earlier, like my mother-in-law, who's a pastor's wife, who, if you ask anyone how they would describe her, and they know her, they call her an angel. That's, imagine that's how people describe you. They call you an angel. I mean, tomorrow knows me. He's not going to call me an angel. <laughs> you know? Like, she's just a godly woman. And she has gone through a year, over a year's worth of suffering. She has bone cancer. And she's like, she's now, there was moments where we thought she had conquered it. And then there were moments where we were told she didn't. And now we were told there's nothing left they can do. What... I have the framing in my mind of why. But that doesn't solve the brokenness in my heart. It doesn't solve our brokenness. And so, I, although it would be really amazing to speak about the Odyssey in today's chapel, I'm going to leave that to your lecturers. They're way smarter than me. I learn from them, right? So they'll do a better job at unpacking that. So maybe you can, you can do that in your next lecture. Okay? Uh, but today I, I want to speak about the theology of the heart. I want to speak about almost like a framing of lament. Lament, like the, the, the word in the Bible is lamentation. You know the book that you read at like your, your, like your, your Bible read, right? That, was, that book was literally written by Jeremiah complaining and like br bitterly sorrowful that the prophecies God had given him were fulfilled in Israel. That's what that whole book is about. You never hear anyone preaching out of lamentation, right? And this is Megan. Ah, brilliant. That's brilliant. Give me a high five. That's amazing. Well done. Well done. Okay. So we got Megan here being an outlier, but I want to speak about how, how God has given us a pathway of grace in the valley of darkness and pain, and it's the gift of lament. And it's something that we don't speak about. When have you ever heard a sermon on lam like lamenting? When? When have you ever, like, you might have heard someone speak about the difference like, between evil and good and love, and like, even that one is... People like coming to church and they like hearing a good sermon. They like living in courage, love, love living inspired. But as you open up the scriptures, you see men and women of God bitterly pouring out their hearts to the Lord, complaining, crying out in sorrow and pain and anger sometimes. And I grew up learning, I don't know how you guys grew up, but I learned I couldn't question God. I heard that I was faithless. That was the lesson I was taught. I was taught I couldn't, I couldn't bring my pain to God because that's like, I mean, I'm just not trusting Him, right? And so I've had over the years, and I think we build this up, and this is what I saw in the, as I look back at this, this youth group. This group, this, you got like 40 students wrestling with the realities of the world, and although we can like share mental models with them, what they're really asking is, what do I do with my brokenness? And we're not helping people. We're not helping, so I, this is a pastoral message. How do we help ourselves and help our people process pain and suffering in the world? And I believe God offers us a beautiful answer in, in, the passage, like in this idea of lamenting. If you think about the book of Job, the book of Job is the only book dedicated to the question, solely dedicated to the question of theodicy, right? Think about it. You got Job and his three friends. Job suffering hectically, loses his family, loses his wealth, loses his wife, like he's, he loses everything. And his friends come and they do often what we do. They start reasoning out why he's suffering. You're a sinner. Like, you need to confess. You need... They, they, people say stupid things. Over the past year, I've heard people say stupid things to me about why my mother-in-law is suffering. Like, just theologically harming things. Book of Job, the whole time, all Job has is lament. That's... It's, it, it, he asks God, why, why, why? And at the end of the day, this is the irony of the book of Job, right? Is that you actually don't get a solid answer. God just says, I'm amazing. Look at the world. Just look. And then the book ends. A book dedicated to theodicy, but it actually it's a book of lament. And at the end of the day, God rebukes the friends 
And he raises up Job and says, you're a man of God. That he was lamenting. If you think of Jesus, his last words on the cross, what were they? They were a cry, it was a cry of lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you want to anchor it into the New Testament, just look at Christ. And then to Telestai, he gives up his spirit, right? It is done. And so Psalm 77 is what is known as a psalm of lament. Actually, this is super interesting. Did you know the book of, the book of Psalms, 150 psalms, right? We know that it's the hymnal of the Old Testament, hymnal of the Hebrew people, the people of Israel. And when we think of, of worship, we've got a lot of worshipers here, right? If you think of your worship set, we sing songs of praise and we sing songs of worship. Today, Mark led worship. He started off with praise. You know, there's like this idea of like, we've got to lift the spirits. We've got to get everyone like, you know, there's like a, a bit of like a practicality about it, you know. Let's get the spirit raised and then let's go deep and just worship and enjoy the presence of God. That's, like, that's the strategy of most worship sets. But when you look at the book of Psalms, out of the 150 psalms, one-third of the worship songs are songs of lament. Songs of saying, God, why, why, why have you forsaken me? That was, that was a reference out of the book of Psalms. One-third. Can you imagine Mark starting off, and he's standing up here, and he's like, guys, today, today we're just going to, um, we're just going to cry to God in pain. <laughs> that, that is not how you build a church, right? That's not how we do it. But, and I think, I think we've lost something as a 21st century church that is this ability to come before God with the reality of our hearts. And so today what I'd like us to do is we're going to unpack Psalm 77. And, and simply all we're going to do is we're going to look at the scripture and we're going to, to ask the question, what, what is the writer saying? that we can learn from in terms of our interaction with God. And before we do that, I want to read just this beautiful quote that I found in the book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, that has a lot to do with this. And I don't know if you can, you can probably read that. I'll read it for you. It says this, Without lament, we won't know how to process pain. Silence, bitterness, and even anger can dominate our spiritual lives instead. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. When you bottle, bottle up your anger and your resentment towards God, it just, it just brings silence, right? In the darkest times of your life. Without lament, we won't know how to help people through sorrow. Instead, we'll offer, and this is what's happened in my case, we'll offer trite solutions, unhelpful comments, or impatient responses. And what's more, without the sacred song of sorrow, we will miss the lessons of historic laments that are intended to teach us. Lament is how Christians grieve. It's how to help hurting people. Lament is how we learn important truths about God in our world. And then he says this, he says, My personal and pastoral experience has convinced me that biblical lament is not only a gift, but also a neglected dimension of Christian life for the 21st century Christian. Anyone feel the, the reality of that? I want to tell you as a pastor, it is a reality. We offer cr tr like, like these very simple solutions. When someone is sitting across the table from you and they're pouring out their heart to you because of the exper what they're experiencing, yes, they do need some kind of framework to understand it, but at the end of the day, they need help with what to do with the brokenness in their heart. How, what do they do with that? As they're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, what do they do? And I believe that the Psalms teach us and give us a way to express that. And so um, I want to I just show you what a, a standard, like, so there's actually a, a pattern to the Lament Psalms that is quite, so it's generic. Not all of the, can you go to the next slide for me, please? Um, this is, there's a four-part pattern when it comes to the, the Psalms of Lament that most of the Psalms of Lament follow, not all of them. And it's this, it first starts with an address toward God. Okay, my God, my God. Then it's a complaint. Why have you forsaken me? Right? And it'll, it'll go on and have a request or start questioning God and it'll end usually with an expression of trust. And we're going to see this four part play out. But it's super interesting that not all psalms end with an expression of trust. Some lament psalms just end. God, where are you? You've left me. You've like abandoned me. Do you even exist? Boom. End of psalm. Can you imagine singing that? 
in your worship set? I mean, it, it might bring some atheists in. They might be like, yeah, that's right. I can sing that song, <laughs> right? But what we're going to see is, is this four-part this four structure really helps us. And, and what I found often is, is we are okay. We, we, can, we can get past the idea of bringing our questions to God once we work through it a bit. And so we're kind of okay with A, and we're kind of okay with D. And what we do when we're struggling with our own pay, pain is we say, God, like, I trust you. So you're recognizing God, and you just say, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. But we skip out A and C. We don't actually deal with the realities because we don't think God can handle it. But I, I think that what God is teaching us through the Scriptures and through the examples of the saints that have come before us, is that we can, like, he's not affected. He, if he is all-powerful and sovereign, like the only thing that is affected when you come before him with your pain is that he, we understand this because of the relational nature of God, is he weeps with us. He's not standing there thinking, Samora, you're, you're a pathetic Christian. How could I have ever called you to ministry? How can you question me? I am a th- can you imagine God like being affected and running off to my little girl? When she doesn't get what she wants, she runs off to her room and she hides under a blanket. I don't think God's like that. God's not effect, like, affected. His sovereignty doesn't aff- is affected when we come to him and say, Lord, why? And so I'd like us to read Psalm 77. Get biblical. And we're gonna, as we're gonna read it, we're gonna read it first, and I wanna just challenge you to try to see if you can see the structure yourself, and then we're gonna look at the structure, and then we're gonna unpack it a little bit in terms of just application. So, Psalm 77. I want you to try to feel what the psalmist is feeling. Um, if you have questions, if you have pain from the past, if you're going through something now, allow this to almost like minister to you. Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was distressed, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my untiring hands and I would not be comforted. I remember you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. And I thought about the former days, the years of long ago, and I remember my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? He will never show His favor again. Will He, he never show His favor again? He is un, his, has His unfailing love vanished forever? This was the questions that these students were asking. Has His promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has his anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his hand. I'm going to just stop there for a moment. And and I just want to ask the question, does anyone resonate with that? Just me? Anyone asked those questions before? I want to tell you, you have permission to. The Word of God has given us permission to come before God and to to br- not only recognize Him and to the call to trust Him. You know, I, I think of that, that interaction that Jesus had. I can't really remember who the character was, but G- Jesus said, like do, you, like, do you, like, do you have faith? And He says, Jesus, like, I believe, teach me to believe. <laughs> right? We, we can have that cognitive understanding in our heads, but our hearts need it too. And so he starts off with this, number one. He starts with an address towards God. Notice this, verse one and two. He says, I cried out to God for my help. We, don't, when we, they, we have a choice when we face the realities of the world. We, we, we know who Jesus is now, but when we face the realities of the world, we have a choice to make. We can either reject God, we can like huddle down and like just isolate ourselves and try to like keep within our mental frameworks, or we can begin to process with God. Right? That's what the call of lament is. It's a call to process with God. It's not like, and this is where deconstruction comes in. People experience the reality of life and they just smash down the entire faith system and they're like, God doesn't exist. Or they just become black, more black and white and they can't, like, they refuse to grow in their faith. But the call of lament, it helps us to process our faith and rebuild something that is beautiful. He said, I cried out to God. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. And that's the first invite. To seek the Lord in our distress. To seek the Lord. To bring that distress before Him. It takes, like, Mark had this moment where he, he said, let's be silent before God. 
but we still chose to make noises. <laughs> you know why I think that is? I think it's because sometimes it's really difficult to be silent before God. <laughs> it's hard to, to come before Him in the realities of the world and just say, Lord, well, this is how it is. It takes faith. The second thing that he, they do is He goes on and He brings us a complaint. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. My spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. This guy was really big. He was bringing it. He wasn't, he wasn't saying, God, I know, you, I know that you're amazing and powerful and all that kind of thing. Could you just help me? He's like, no, 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 you're not listening to me. And he was bringing his complaint as it was. There was no buttering up of like, oh, Lord, Lord let me just lift you up a bit and then I'm going to be, bring you my real like, reality. He was saying, this is how I feel, Lord. And God, God's word says, this is acceptable. The, the people of Israel sang this song. And they worship said, I mean, that's like, it, it blows my mind. So he brings this complaint, and then the questions. Let's go to the next slide. And, and this is the thing that I, I, I would like to, to challenge you with. Because there's this idea that doubt is toxic to faith. But I've come to learn that unexpressed doubt is what is toxic to my faith. And as you read these questions, the challenge and the question I have is what questions do I have hidden in my heart that I've been unwilling and feeling too uncomfortable to bring to the Lord? What questions are sitting in your congregation's hearts, the people you minister, that they're just not willing, I don't feel the freedom to express, that is actually becoming toxic to their faith system? That when they actually come head to head with the realities of the world, it'll just force them to crumble because their foundations aren't set properly. Will the Lord reject me forever? Will He never show His favor again? Has His unfailing love vanished forever? Has His promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? These are all good questions. The questions I've asked. But I want you to notice what He does. There's a pivot in verse 10 that will lead us to the rest of the psalm, which leads us into the fourth section. Let's go back for a second. Thank you, man. Don't worry. Then I thought... To this I will appeal, the years when the Most High stretched out His right hand. The right hand of God, source of power. You've learned this, right? And then He goes on, and what does He do? He goes back and He begins to refer back to the redemption story of Israel. Right? It's beautiful. Let's read it together. Let's read it together. Go to the next slide. I will remember. So He's starting to, he's starting to remember. He's expressing trust. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is a great, is great as our God? He, a, he just started speaking about how his God has like rejected him. And I was like, what God is great? He's reminding himself of the redemption story that he inherited. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God. It's like the, the splitting of the waters. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and rivered. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder. Can you just imagine singing this during church? It would be amazing. This is like drum. Like, anyway. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your light. You. Your lighting lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Through your footprint, uh, though, though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So not only does he, this is a healthy way of lament. This is the strategy. To come bring your lament towards God. He's not offended. To, to come and bring your complaint, to bring your questions, but then to anchor that reality that you've just expressed to Him in the reality and the redemptive story of God. Now back then, the redemptive story of God was, was I mean, it was connected to that moment of Israel, going through the, the, the Red Sea, from, from death and slavery to life into the promised land. That's the redemption story. And you and I, our redemption story, although connected to that is is actually so much more beautiful and so much more tangible. Because our redemption story is not just connected to the, the event of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, although that is central. 
It is also connected to the person of Jesus, a relationship that we can have with God. So it's not just, we don't just have an event we can think back on and be like, oh, well, our country won this war all those years ago, we'll win this war now. No, we're connecting ourselves to the person and the works of Jesus Christ, which is a beautiful gift that you and I have. And so I want to encourage you. I'm, I'm actually bringing this, this to a close. All, all I want to say to you is I reflect back over, over the years of ministry as I've sat, I, I sat across a table from um, a student whose mother, like since the student was born, her, his, her mother has had a chronic disease that is just, it's, it causes pain throughout her body. 24-7, she's in pain all the time. Can hardly move. And this student sat across the table from me and she, she was just weeping. And she was trying to process, how can a good God allow my mom to, do, to die like this or be suffering like this? Not even like, if, she, if I recall correctly, she even said it would be better that my mom just died because she's just in pain all the time. Why hasn't God just taken her? That would be more merciful. Now, she was sitting there and she was weeping. And I could have sat there and I could have just been like, okay, hey, well, let me, no, you stop right now. You're being unfaithful. Your mom actually was a sinner and that's why she's in pain. You know, I could do all those things that we, we tend to do. We make easy statements. But actually, as I sat there, I just realized that all God was calling me to do is weep with her. And Mark knows this. Maura knows this. Like, I don't cry regularly. <laughs> I'm not a crier, <laughs> right? Mark makes a joke about it often. <laughs> Jason's crying. This is like a miracle, right? But, but the Holy Spirit touched my heart, and I wept with her. And that was a breakthrough moment for her. Because she had permission to lament and to process that. And I just said to her, I, I don't know why. I mean, I can give you the answers that I have in my mental mind, but this is like God is actually inviting us to bring this pain towards Him. And I, and I invite you is simply this as I close. I want to invite you to, to write a psalm of lament. For those of you who are worship leaders, it might be a little bit easier but I want to invite you to write down this four, these four steps and just ask the question, Lord, okay, Lord? And it doesn't have to be a long, it doesn't have to be a long as Psalm 77. Okay, let's put it there. It's quite a long one. But it can be, simply just be this. Address God. What complaints do you have stored up in your heart that the Lord knows about? He knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought in your mind. He knows it. He just knows you haven't brought it to Him. What complaints can you bring to the Lord that is real for you? What request or question do you have for the Lord that you haven't expressed to Him faithfully? And how can you take all of that and then move towards an expression of trust? So, Lord, you, you've heard me. It's not just about the event of the resurrection. You've given me new life. I, I can I recognize that you're with me. You walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. And I think that, that is the invite in all of this. You know, we, we know Psalm 23 like that, that, uh, that picture of God being with us in the valley of the shadow of death, but often it's in the valley that we feel the loneliest, right? And I know from my own journey that often when I've been the loneliest in the valley, it's because I've been trying to reason out my pain and, and I bottle those things up. But when I've actually come to God and be like, God, actually, I don't feel like you've honored me. <laughs> you know, like, I'm a pastor. I've given my life to the church. I've given my life to you. Why can't you just give me a break and give me that Mercedes Benz? <laughs> right? It's in those moments where I invite God in that I actually begin to feel His presence as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And so I would, I'm, I'm going to close here. That's, that's my challenge to you. You can, you can do with that what you want. And I also want to invite you as, you, as you experience the pain of your congregation and your church members and your ministry, to keep this in mind, that we have the permission to bring our lament to the Lord's Lord. Can I ask you to stand with me? And I, I, I want to close and just pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, you know the story of every single person that is in this room today. Lord, you know every thought in their mind, you know every hair on their head, you know every pain and experience that they have gone through, and you know where they are right now, Lord. And I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would begin the process of just filling us with your presence that, Lord, you would bring to mind the questions that we have that we've been too uncomfortable to bring to you, that you already know we have in our hearts. 
the complaints that we've stored up, that we've hidden away because we felt unfaithful. Lord, I pray that you begin to raise us up to the surface. Lord, you know those that are within my heart. I lift them up to your hands. And Lord, right now, I want to invite you to anchor, help us anchor the realities of this world that we experience in the reality of you, Jesus. Begin to do a work of healing, I pray, in this space. Do a work of healing in my heart, in the hearts of this group. And help us, Lord, to be healers of others. That we wouldn't be the kind of pastors and ministry leaders who offer trite solutions, but instead, Father God, we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you and with others. Give us the grace we need to do that, Lord, we pray. In God's name we say, Amen. Amen.